hello, good morning. Thank you, Mandra, for having me. Thank you all for being here. Um, as Mandra said, I'm going to talk about Glam Labs, uh, the community and the book that we wrote in five days. Uh, but beforehand, let me introduce myself really briefly. Um, I'm coming from the Austrian National Library. This is an actual picture from the library. Uh, so what you see there is it's very old. Uh, we claim it's 650 years old, although this can be disputed, but definitely very old, very beautiful, um, very established. Um, and for them to take the risk to introduce something such as a lit, just such as a lab that will then experiment, will overcome barriers, as Mandra pointed out, uh, will transform, will push boundaries, um, is well, uh, unique, uh, and in our case, um, other than with the BL, we, we haven't been externally funded, uh, so it was the library making that decision very consciously. And we founded OMB Labs. Uh, we launched about a year ago, so we're still pretty young. Um, we are a, a team of one and a half person, me being the half person. Um, not because I'm tiny, but just because I'm only part-time employed. Um, my technical lead um, did an amazing job trying to find bits and pieces of how to put this lab together. Um, and before we started, um, we had a long planning period, which was fantastic for us, but was also kind of a necessity because we ha didn't have a real plan. So usually when the Austrian National Library starts a project, they try to be very precise on what this project should, should achieve, what, what it should do, who should do it, whatever. They have like a very long uh, phase of planning. So they did with our project, but with us, they put in all of these fancy words such as it should be innovative, it should go to, digi the, the, um, uh, go to, to the digital space, should attack digital humanists, maybe artists, maybe all of these all of these big words but not not a very precise plan so we um, were in the great position to um, try to form a plan ourselves uh, and created the um, this uh, what is maybe a bit too big the OMB labs manifesto which in our case was simply favor quality over quantity um, sharing is our core principle and let's tell good stories in the beginning um, was our first challenge was find collections. Naively, um, and I have the notebook back to prove it, um, the first question that I wrote down when I started working there is, what digital collections do we have and who do I talk to to find these collections? That's not a thing. We don't have a list of all of these collections. There's no, not a person that, that, is in, in, that can t could tell us what digital collections we have and where they are located. So it was finding, finding collections um, such as a needle in a haystack um, and finding the curators that would be open to collaborate with labs. The way that we designed the labs afterwards was largely influenced um, by Ben Osteen, actually, <laughs> who gave a talk in St. Pölten in Austria, close by, by Vienna, um, and had this wonderful slide up of the hierarchy of needs. Um, so starting with navigating through the collections, exploring the data, filtering, um, wanting to reuse it, uh, labeling stuff, combining, and then training. Um, so we thought, OK, let's start with the first thing, so navigating and then exploring. Um, and make sure that we try to present our collections in a very easy way. Also, um, I don't know whether that's a library thing or whether that's, I don't, I, I, but what, what is very common in the Austrian National Library is that we don't name our collections as was, what they are, but give them some fancy acronym that doesn't make any sense. Um, so we decided, okay, let's maybe not do that, um, but just call our collections historic newspapers or historic postcards. Uh, so the name would, would actually explain what it is and not who funded the project or uh, what, which name sounds fancy. Um, another thing that I didn't really expect before I was, was starting working there is our collections don't only consist by actual physical collections that have been digitized um, or born digital, but also by machine readable data. So um, a data set is not always what you would imagine. Um, Sparkle and the linked open data set um, being one of our most prominent examples for that. Um, we share code. As I said, sharing is a core principle. We have our own GitLab set up. Um, we invite people to fork it, to play with it, to um, write us tickets. 
Um, we used Jupyter notebooks quite a bit. We um, tried to experiment ourselves as well uh, in setting up the lab, um, and we share our Jupyter notebooks, um, and again, also give workshops on, on using that um, technology. We try to, to really grab everything that we can. So also another thing that has been developed in-house is a IIIF image API um, called Sasha. Again, a simple access to cultural heritage data. Ugh, I don't know. Um, but yeah. Um, uh, so we reuse that as well. Um, we allow through that um, our users to, to build collections themselves from the various data sets. Um, and we already think about how to use that in the future. We'd like to have um, users use the collections that they build on the OMB labs uh, that will then, um, out of the box, implement transcribers so they can um, uh, correct the OCR that isn't always too lovely. Um, and what we also want them to be able to do in the future is to create their own annotations and add other user-generated content, such as comments. Uh, and all of that. We couldn't have done any of this, um, I have to say, without the example of international glam labs. Um, Mahandra was actually one of the first person I talked to when I, when I started this lab. Um, we tried to steal shamelessly from all of the international examples um, by either just looking at how, how they've done things, but also by um, trying to find what kind of maybe APIs they created themselves, what kind of bits and bobs of uh, open code that we can reuse. Um, and that was really important in, in developing all of this. Another thing that happened last year uh, was the first meeting of the building library labs uh, group. Back then it was just library labs. Now we're transformed into glam labs and expand constantly. Um, Mahendra hosted this event last year. I have to say I was very excited about it, but also a bit skeptical. Um, it's like, are there even enough labs? Is there, is there like, are we all just navel gazing then? Um, I was like, any, any kind of skepticism was completely transformed when I was here. Um, it was an amazing event. I think people from 60 countries came along. It was, um, it was, it was crazy inspiring. It was absolutely lovely because when you are this subversive little cell in a institution such as a library uh, or national library, even more so, um, you're a bit alone as well. <laughs> um, you so so having a community of people that are all trying to subvert something because they actually really like it, <laughs> not because they want to bring down the library, but, but if anything, because they want to give it a new way um, to, to operate in a very transformed community was really inspiring and, and very and taught me a hell of a lot. That's just a little sketch um, that was, uh, that actually was produced during this event. Um, it was produced, please don't, by, I don't know whether I pronounced the name correctly, Emmanuel Berne. Uh, I sat next to her while she was scribbling that, um, and I just put it up because I thought it was just like a really lovely example of how colorful, but also confused, but also really structured, and also really pretty, uh, the idea to set up a lab in an institution such as a glam institution is. The book sprint in Doha, that was the next event that I attended. There was actually another building library labs uh, event in Copenhagen earlier this year, um, just a mere year after the first Building Library Labs event, uh, we were invited uh, to the book sprint in Doha, Qatar uh, this September. Um, if you don't know what a book sprint is, don't beat yourself up about it. I've never heard about it before I was invited to one. Um, and it is what it sounds like. It is the idea to, in a very short amount of time, write a book. We were 16 people that met, met up in Doha to write a book in just five days. We went completely alone. Um, it was a supervised process, and that was um, very crucial. Um, so we had a supervisor from, from a uh, company called Book Sprints, um, and, in, in, and who guided us through the process. It was... Um, very interesting idea. Like she would, she would always just pretty much tell us what our next task would be, 
Um, so in the very beginning, you don't really focus on the idea that there will be a book in five days, but you're just like, okay, let's collect ideas, then let's start writing on one particular idea. So there was a lot of writing, just producing text as quickly as possible, um, uh, and nevertheless tried to make to not have it be nonsensical, ideally. Um, the book sprint method was also to work with a specific <laughs> software. Um, it was um, great that we had two two editors that would. They, I think they're located both in Australia, um, so they could work during what their daytime was um, and our nighttime was on the text that we produced, edited, gave us feedback on the next day, and had us revise what we created. There were a lot of group discussions. It was very intense <laughs> um, and uh, very very interesting as well. We had because the thing is. Group discussions are nice, but at the, at the same time, you're working against the clock, right? If you try to produce a, a book in just five days. Um, there were group meals, <laughs> um, because the, the situation being doing that in Doha as well was so intense, because you hardly ever left the hotel, right? And you were always together. You spent like freaking 16, 17, 18 days um, together as a group of 16 people. Um, so yeah, that definitely in increased the intensity. We presented the, we presented the ideas back, back to the groups and maybe the most important cr and, and crucial part was the group reviews. Um, so we reviewed and rewrote and, and kept on going back and forth between all of the chapters. And one of the great things that that um, came with is that you totally lost any ownership. Um, I have to say, if you would ask me now, I don't, I couldn't point out which part of the book I, I contributed to or what what my words were. Maybe here or there I can recognize a phrase, but that's about it. And I think it was particularly interesting in this group because given that we try to have experimentation um, as the core thing that we want people to do, we're also quite open to these experiments. Um, and are therefore, and, and we're therefore also all quite open to the idea um, to be part of this slightly, slightly strange, slightly, um, slightly weird, but also extremely exciting and extremely new um, process to to create this book. Yeah. So reviewing was 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 definitely the longest and most exhausting part, but wonderfully, after five days, we had a book. Um, it's called Open a Glam Lab. And um, it's available online. It's open access. Um, so again, I think the next slide has that even on. Yeah. In uh, working together with, with our general values, uh, and one of them, uh, the first one actually, being radical openness. Um, it's licensed on a CC0. You can download it um, <coughs> online, as for example, on our new Glam, International Glam Labs community website glamlabs.io. Um, it's listed on publications. Um, it's a community that is only growing and uh, that is very open, very, very loving, uh, that is happy to, uh, to, to answer any questions. Um, there is a WhatsApp group that has like 65 people in now. Uh, there is a Twitter handle, there's a Slack channel. Um, communication is very important to us as well, um, as you can tell. And um, we're only growing, and I'm very excited to be part of this community, um, and I'm thanking you for having me today. Thanks a lot.